Okay, so uh, this is a an overview of chapter four. Just going to make sure that I go over the concepts that are probably some of the more important ones. So first off, since this chapter is lar is focused on socialization, uh, we should start out with a definition. Um, and a definition really is that socialization is the process by which society transmits its norms and values to its members so that they can function properly in society. It really involves the process of learning the norms and the values and the traditions, the language, you know, all, the, all the things that go into being part of a contributing member of society. That's socialization. Um, and of course, socialization doesn't just uh, occur when we're young, it occurs throughout our lifetimes. We never s stop being socialized. And you may think to yourself, well, how is that possible? Well, consider that if you're planning to become a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or an architect or a social worker, whatever it might be, you don't know how to do that yet. And so you will get a degree, you will do training, and you will learn how to become that thing. That's part of socialization. You may at some point become a parent. Learning how to become a parent is something that is, you don't just read a book or a magazine and bam, you're a parent. That is a continual process of learning and any parent probably will tell you that. So um, that's socialization. And I'm gonna focus on the theories of self. Of, of the concept of self. It's this idea that an individual has of him or herself. That's the concept of self. So I'm going to start with Sigmund Freud's idea. Um, and I know some of you, if you've taken a psych class or a psych major, you may think to yourself, wow, why is psychology um, or a psych guy who is a psychiatrist, why is he part of this uh, chapter or this course? Well, it turns out that while Sigmund Freud was not a sociologist, the particular theory that I'm going to go over um, does focus, ha have part of a focus on sociology. So Freud believed that there were three parts of the personality, the id, the ego, and the superego. Um, he believed that the id, uh, which he said was the irrational pleasure-seeking part of the personality, is something that everyone is born with. Okay, all children are born with the id. And that makes sense if you've ever seen an infant. It's all about me, right? For an infant, um, they cry when they're wet. They cry when they want to be fed. They cry when they want to be held. It's all about them. Um, that's the id, irrational, pleasure-seeking part of the self. The superego, this represents morality. Um, and as I said, though Freud was not a sociologist, he recognized that we are not born with a sense of morality, that we have to learn that sense of morality and where we learn it is from the people around us, the people in our social environments. Um, and of course, Freud believed that you could either inherit or you could either learn a very strong sense of morality or a weak sense of morality or something in the middle. The ego, that is the part of the personality that Freud argued um, represents the conscious mind and it mediates the conflict between the id and the superego. Okay? Um, and I'll give you an example that I think will make sense to you. If you have a job, part-time or otherwise, if you have a job, um, maybe you have a weekend off and you have a really great weekend and Monday morning rolls around and the alarm clock goes off and you're supposed to get up to go to work. And as you turn off the alarm clock, you think, hmm, I should call in sick today. I deserve another day off. Okay, well, that's the id. That's the id, that part of us that just wants pleasure, wants to stay in that nice warm bed and just have another relaxing day. The superego likely kicks in and reminds you that you not you really shouldn't call in sick when you're not sick, um, that you should really use those days or save those days for when you are sick, and that if you call in sick, then other people might have to pick up the slack um, depending upon the kind of job you do, might have to pick up the slack since you're gone that day. Um, and, you know, likely you might lie there a couple, two, three, four, five minutes or so going back and forth between, yes, I should call in sick. No, I should not. Yes, I should. No, I shouldn't. And eventually a choice will be made. You'll either pick up the phone, call in sick, or you will 
drag your butt out of bed and you will go and shower up and, and drive to work or take the bus to work or whatever you do. Um, that is classic. That's a classic example of what Freud argued is happening for us on a regular basis. Now, of course, Freud believed that we're often faced with much larger moral challenges, right? I mean, calling in sick when you're not, mm, yeah, you really shouldn't do that, right? But bigger moral challenges um, are also when we face this pull between the id and the superego, and then the ego has to step in and mediate um, for us. Now, for Freud, there are people who have a very strong superego, maybe too strong a superego. These will be people who will be very authoritarian in their, in their behavior, yeah, and they'll be very judgmental toward people who don't meet their standards. And then you've got people who will have a lesser developed sense of morality, and these will be people who will perhaps um, call in sick uh, more than they should, you know, they, they'll be more likely, uh, their ego, their conscious mind will be more likely to give in to the id more frequently because their sense of morality is weaker. Okay, and so of course Freud believed that you could either have too strong a superego or, or too weak. Um, so something in the middle is, is good. Um, then let's focus on Charles Cooley's idea. Cooley um, believed that when we interact with others, um, we are picking up a sense of how they perceive us because of how they treat us. So Cooley's theory is called looking glass self because it's really about this idea that, and looking glass is an old term, uh, an old 19th century term for um, a mirror. What Cooley essentially is suggesting is that when we interact with someone else, it's as though that person is holding up a mirror in front of them as they're talking to us. And what we see reflected back at us is ourselves. And what Cooley was saying is that how a person perceives us is generally how they will treat us. And so if they treat us as though we are beautiful or handsome or intelligent or wonderful, that's what we will see projected back at us. And over time, we will internalize that as part of our self-identity. Now, of course, it's not always good. If someone perceives us as being lazy, as um, never being able to do anything right, or as dumb, etc., and we perceive that often enough from someone or people around us, then we may take on that or internalize that as part of our personality. Um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty simplistic but very important idea because I do think that too often, especially young children, they begin to believe something about themselves um, just simply because other people call them certain things or treat them in a certain way and they become to believe that they really are those things. And then um, there's George Herbert Mead. And George Herbert Mead didn't disagree with Cooley. In fact, he agreed with Cooley. But he didn't think Cooley was specific enough about how this happened. And so what Mead did is he put stages to this process. So, for example, the preparatory stage. This is the stage from birth to about age two, um, wherein a child is simply mimicking those around him or her. Okay. Um, and you can see this in a young child um, pretending to read a book. The book might be upside down or they might be you know, turning the pages the wrong way, etc. Uh, or a young child uh, who is uh, pretending to use a phone, etc. Um, in fact, that is exactly how we learn language, by mimicking the sounds around us. Because all language is just a bunch of sounds. And if we understand the sounds, then we understand the language. If we don't, then we don't understand the language. It's pretty simple. Play stage. Play stage is from uh, age about age three to about age seven or so. Um, and this is, uh, in Cooley's view, play stage is when children begin to take on the role of significant others within their social environments. Um, and for most children, um, their mother is a significant uh, other, their father is a significant other or a significant figure. Um, perhaps um, their preschool teacher is a significant figure, a grandparent, etc. But 
because their children, significant others, might also be people that they see around them that they view as important or that they pick up that others view as important, a doctor or a firefighter or a police officer, etc. And so they may play at being those things. And then the, the game stage, the third stage, this is roughly ages um, seven, eight, all the way through adolescence. And this is where we really begin to learn that the people around us matter, that people around us have expectations of us, and that what we do doesn't just affect ourselves, it affects other people too. Um, so we, this is the stage where, of course, by the time we're adolescents, we have developed this to a much greater extent than when we're eight, nine, 10. But we really believe, we begin to, to understand our parents want us to do well in school or our parents want us to be uh, sharing with our, our siblings or that our teacher wants us to raise our hands before we speak, etc. We start really understanding that these expectations come not just from the people around us, but also from the larger society, or in Mead's words, the generalized others. Um, and so this is how we learn how to be contributing members of society. We learn what society at large expects of us. And so by the time that we leave K through 12, most of us are able to go out into the world and to have a job and to go to school or to do things out in the world that we might not have been able to do at two or five or six because we didn't understand those expectations that other people have of us. Um, also, let me get to the Thomas theorem. Thomas theorem is really important too, and I, I, I urge you to really consider the importance of, of this really simple statement. And the statement is, if people define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. Here's the idea. We all go into social environments every single day, and some of them are familiar to us, but some of them are ambiguous. And we, we don't always know what to make of those situations. So we perceive the situation, the social environment, in a particular way that is unique to ourselves. That becomes our reality. Um, here's my example of this. Let's say you and, and a couple of friends go to a kickback um, or hangout or whatever you call it. Um, and as you're driving home, one of your friends says, wow, that was a really great kickback or party or whatever. I had such a great time. There's some really cool people there. And another of your friends, the other friend says, uh, oh, that was just the boringest thing. Ah, oh, God, I can't believe I wasted my time going to that. Um, and you're in the middle. You know, if you say, well, it wasn't as bad as you think, um, but I don't think it was as great as you think. I had a decent time. Yeah, there's some interesting people, but it wasn't, you know, overly exciting or overly boring. None of you is wrong. Each of you is right in your own, in your own unique way, because that is your unique experience. And so I want you to consider how when someone says, I experienced this, I experienced X, this, I felt that Y was judging me in this way or was treating me in this way because of this personal characteristic of mine. The last thing that anybody should say to that person is, why are, why are you always thinking it's about your sexual orientation? Or why are you always thinking it's about your gender? Or why are you always thinking it's about your race or your ethnicity? It probably wasn't that at all. That is not what someone wants to hear. How they perceive that situation, even though that isn't what you perceived, doesn't mean that their perception and how they felt about that social environment is wrong. It's their perception. It's very real to them. Um, and so rather than judge them for their perception and their ex how they say they experienced the social environment, we should support and believe them that their experience is real to them. Um, also, I want to focus on dramaturgy. Dramaturgy is um, a concept by a social psychologist named um, Erding Goffman. Um, social psychology is a combination, a melding together of sociology and psychology. I teach a social psychology course for the University of Laverne. Um, and so it, it is a very real discipline. 
And Goffman suggested something that Shakespeare said over 500 years ago. Um, and it's a simple saying, but it's something that is very true. Shakespeare once wrote, all the world's a stage and we are merely actors in it. What does that mean? Well, Shakespeare was suggesting, as does Goffman, that as we go about our daily business and we go to class or we go to work or we go uh, to Starbucks or to a restaurant or whatever, it, for the most part, we're interacting with others as though we're in a play on a stage. And society gives us all these loosely written scripts so that we can know how we're supposed to act in a number of, of social environments. And we take that loosely written script and we tweak it a little bit to our own unique individual individual personality, um, but we're largely following the script. So I want you to consider when you go to a job interview, it doesn't matter what the job is, but there are some rules in the script that we most of us most of us follow. Get there early, dress as professionally as the job would require, uh, look the interviewer in the eye, ask questions uh, about the the employer. You know, all of those things are things that we know to do if we want to try to get a job. Going on a first date. Um, who does the asking? Okay, and let's use the heterosexual dating script um, because that's what's depicted in so many rom-coms that I'm sure everyone is familiar with it. Um, the female is supposed to wait for a male to ask her out. Um, at some point, they decide to, to go out somewhere. At some point, the date's going to end. Uh, who gets to decide how it's going to end according to the heterosexual dating script, the female does. Um, and so we all know that on first dates, people are generally not their authentic selves. That's where impression management comes in. Goffman talked about how in, in some of our social interactions, it's almost like we're, we're trying to manage the way that other people perceive us. And we certainly are when we're first dating somebody. We're certainly trying to manage the impression someone has of us when we go to a job interview or when we meet a significant other's family for the first time, those are definitely situations when we're trying to manage how someone perceives us. Okay. So um, again, uh, an important idea. Um, the agents of socialization, I'm not going to go over because the textbook has some very, uh, a very good discussion of these four agents, but I will just quickly uh, add a fifth one, and that is religion. Um, religion is not discussed in the text, but I do consider it to be a fifth agent of socialization for many people, not just in the United States, but around the world. Religion shapes um, not just their senses of morality, but it also sh shape, tends to shape their sense of th their worldview, you know, how society, what kind of a society um, they should be living in or how their society uh, should be. Um, again, not for everybody, but for, I think, a, a fair number of people uh, throughout the world. All right, so um, let me get to statuses and roles. A status is a position um, that a person occupies within society. Um, and there are a bunch of different statuses. I'll name, I'll name some now. Uh, mother, father, son, daughter, cousin, niece, nephew, friend, uh, significant other, um, co-worker, teammate, classmate. These are all um, different types of statuses that people have in society. And a scribe status is one that is um, typically one that a person is born with, um, and it's unlikely to change. Um, it's not always something you're born with, though. For example, if you are a cousin to someone else, you didn't do anything to get that status. Um, when you were born, that status came along to you, or maybe you already existed, maybe you're the older cousin, and when that cousin was born, um, you now had a new status cousin. Okay, um, It's unlikely to change, obviously, it, with today's technology. It sometimes is possible, but you know, typically gender is thought to be an ascribed status, uh, race, ethnicity, thought to be ascribed statuses. An embodied status, status is one that is, is within our physical selves, so based on our physicality, how we look, maybe skin color, maybe um, attractiveness, maybe height or weight, those are, those are embodied statuses. Uh, in achieved status, as the name implies, you have to do something 
to earn that status. So a doctor, a lawyer, engineer, architect, those are all achieved statuses. You had to, people have to do something in order to get those statuses. Um, a master status. A master status is the one that overrides all the others. It supersedes all the other statuses. Um, however, it can be either, the master status can be either the status that society views as the most important one, or the master status can also be the one the individual believes to be their most important one. So if you see um, someone in a hospital um, with a lab, white lab coat on and a stethoscope stuffed in the pocket or around the neck with a name tag that says Dr. You know, Sancho or Dr. Fulanita, then um, it would be you know, fairly uh, common for you to think, okay, this person's a doctor, which might lead you to believe that that is the master status of the person because it takes a lot of work to become a doctor. However, if you ask that individual, maybe that person would say, no, being a parent is my master status, or being a son or a daughter is my master status, or, or something else. Okay. Um, so those are statuses. Now, I want to also um, talk about roles, because roles are a set of behaviors that are attached, or we expect from uh, a status. So if we think about a mother or, or a father, and I'm just going to make it uh, gender neutral and say a parent. We want parents to be caring and loving and nurturing, and uh, we we believe parents should um, validate their children and make sure that they're clean and they eat nutritious food, etc. Those are things we expect parents to do. Not all parents do. Some do it better than others, uh, which is known as role performance. But where I really want to focus is on role conflict and role strength. Well, conflict is when you have two or more statuses and the roles within those statuses conflict. So um, a simple example here. Let's say there's a student who is also an employee. Um, and this student works part time, eight to one, has afternoon classes. And on one particular day, um, the student is driving to work or commuting to work and thinks, OK, today when I get off at one o'clock, I'm going to go straight to campus and I'm going to study for a couple of hours before my 3.30 class where I have to take a midterm. Great plan. However, life always throws monkey wrenches in even the best of plans. Um, Mid-morning, the supervisor comes in and says, hey, um, I really need you to work um, late today because two people called in sick and you're the only one I can trust to close. I need you to work um, until nine o'clock tonight, um, but you're going to get overtime. In fact, I'll pay you double time, not just time and a half. Okay, now the student has a decision to make. I need to go to school and study and take that test, but I'm a student and extra money is always welcome. Um, and so that student is going to have to figure out, okay, two statuses, student, worker. Both of them are requiring something at the same time. The student's going to have to decide which one of those is most important at this point in time. It might not be the same answer two or three weeks from now. It might be a different answer. And not everybody's going to make the same decision. So, um, role conflict. Role strain. Role strain is when you have a single status, one status. Um, and this may help you, maybe not. Um, the way I remember, remembered it as an undergraduate was role strain, strain, single status. Okay. So you have one status. And... You have multiple roles, but sometimes those roles come into conflict. So I'm thinking about a parent here. Let's say, um, as we said, or I said, um, we want parents to be caring and loving and nurturing, but sometimes a child harms another child or harms another person or does something um, that he or she shouldn't have done. The parent has to then discipline the child. And I can guarantee you, in particular, young children, they do not think, wow, I am so glad my parent loves me so much that my parent is disciplining me right now. Even older children, you know, in high school, if your parent grounds you and you can't go to um, that that dance or that prom or whatever, um, that that teen is not sitting in his or her room thinking, "Wow, I'm so glad my parents love me." No, that teen is probably sitting there thinking, "I hate my parents; they ruined my life." Um, it's difficult to appear caring and nurturing as a parent when you're also disciplining that child at the same time. 
Um, and then finally, role exit. And I'll use the example of uh, Tammy Duckworth there. She's a senator. Um, I forget what state, but she's a senator. And um, you see that she uh, has her newborn child with her. Um, she went to um, the floor of the Senate for an important vote with her day old baby. Uh, I think the baby was four or five days old at the time, something like that, maybe six. Um, and let's say that um, Senator Duckworth loves being a senator, loves doing the work, it's important work, but Senator Duckworth also maybe feels pulled uh, in another direction because another status that she has obviously is that of parent. Um, and so she wants to spend more time with her children while they're young. And flying back and forth between Washington, DC, and I, I, think, it's, I think she's from Illinois, but I'm not sure. Um, but she has a commute flying back and forth and that takes time away from her children. And she feels like she's gotta be in Washington, DC for important votes. And maybe she decides to leave her, her senator's position, the Senate position. Maybe she resigns and decides being with her children is more important. That would be role exit. So, um, let's see. All right, good. Okay, so that's those are the important concepts that I wanted to cover um, just in this brief uh, overview. So um, I'll trust that you read the rest of the chapter and I'll see you uh, for chapter five. Bye.